Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Epic Fantasy Romance. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. Delicious. Today is Thursday, August 11th, and uh, beautiful morning here in Santa Fe. Sunny, sunny morning. I'm also running a bit behind, so it's sunnier than usual. Uh, we went for a walk this morning. I also set up the cover reveal for shadow wizard. Yes. So this will be book one in renegades of magic and it's um, Jadrin and Sully's story. For those of you who have not been following along. I didn't light the mosquito candle this morning. So um, I'm doing the cover reveal on Instagram bit by bit. Um, in fact, that reminds me, I should have done another one, but I haven't yet. I'll do it as soon as the podcast is done. So, um, so I had to get that all set up this morning, got the pre-order set up last night. It'll be out September 29th. Um, fingers crossed. I'm, I'm past 50,000 words on it. I think it's, it's going all right. Not sure how it's going to end, where it's going to end, but, um, that's typical for me, right? All part of the, I think it's funny when authors say that that's part of the fun for them, that they, uh, the gardeners or the pantsers, the ones who don't pre-plot, uh, say that the fun goes out of it for them if they do that. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if it's, if I would call it fun, but it's, it's how it works for me. Sometimes as those of you who are long time podcast listeners will know, it's decidedly unfun for me. Now, so, um, a few different things to talk about today. I even have notes. So I'm trying to decide if I could talk about this one thing. Uh, kind of uh, sorry I'm waffling let me pause all right I figured out a way I can talk about it uh recently I was asked to be part of a thing I mean that's great that's I appreciate being asked to be part of things but then it came out uh, I was asked I was actually not asked this was part of the problem I was given instructions on how to share it on social media and I was told that I must share it on social media, uh, in order to bring my platform, bring my readers to this thing, which I find very interesting. And it's not the first time this has happened. Uh, and I may have talked about this before, but there are any number of events who, uh, I don't want to say demand, but they, they, sometimes they demand, they ask an author to participate and then expect that the author will bring their readership with them to support the event, which is if it's like for charity or something like that, understandable, um, you know, like that pixel project that was raising money to end violence against women. Yeah, sure. I'm going to ask my readers to come and be part of that. But there are other events where they're totally depending on the authors to bring their readership in order to float their event. And this is partly what was amazing about a polycon was a polycon uh, invited us to participate and they brought the readers. I recently heard of another convention. I think I talked about this, but I'll, I'll revisit it because I still find it so shocking. Another convention that um, has for a long time been famous for uh, nickel and diming authors and demanding, uh, demanding, you know, say more money. And this particular story it actually counts as a demand where an author who attended this paid upfront and it was a considerable amount that you had to pay upfront to attend this convention 
<clears throat> far more than the readers or attendees have to pay. Uh, and then there's all sorts of opportunities for sponsorships uh, that cost more and more and more money. And this author was pulled aside during the convention and told that she had not brought enough readers to the convention that her platform wasn't big enough and therefore she needed to cough up a thousand dollars to sponsor something at the conference right then and there. And this author was devastated. I mean there are so many levels of awful and wrong about this uh, this particular convention. I'm not surprised that they did it. I absolutely believe it happened. The sources are impeccable. They might try to claim that there was a misunderstanding but the author in question was devastated. Uh, nobody <laughs> first of all nobody wants to hear that they're supposed to cough up a thousand dollars especially if you're a newer author and you can't afford it uh, and nobody wants to hear that that somebody thinks that you have like got shitty ability to bring readers to something. Uh, so, so it's a thing, um, that this whole, oh, well, you need to bring your readership. And in this particular case, uh, they were very specific supplied social media examples. And usually the right way to do this, the right way to do this is people say, um, Hey, here's some graphics to share. We'd love if you would share this on your social media. Boom. Uh, they might give you some suggested stuff but uh, you don't you're not required to do it. Um, being told that I must do something that the event won't be successful unless I do this thing is uh, it gives me pause because as an author especially if this is not a charitable event why am I doing this if they don't have the oomph to bring their own readership to it. Uh, you know I understand it's hard but yeah it um it 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 really bothered me. It it annoyed me and I talked to David about it and he said well you know can you imagine if somebody asked <laughs> well he always uses big examples he has an exalted idea of who I am but he's like can you imagine if they asked Billy Givens to come play and then told him that oh but he needed to tweet certain things to make sure that enough people showed up for the event. Uh, yeah there's just ways to do things and ways not to and um, you know one thing about social media and I know I say this often is even if you decide to schedule things or if you have people help you with it social media is about connecting personally right. It's about doing things the way you do them uh, and so you don't <laughs> I don't do my social media like somebody else tells me to do it. Let's let's just say that's a hard stop. So that was something that was on my mind. Um, and then there's been discussion uh, on Twitter and it's interesting because I don't follow enough on Twitter to always know the origins of things and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of tracing back. So I'm not sure where all the conversation about gatekeepers has come from. I know some of the things that I've been talking about in the last week about how much money authors do and don't make on trad publishing. So there was a tweet thread from someone who said um, talked about self publishing and I will link to her Twitter thread. Uh, she's gotten a lot of quote to tweets and retweets and likes on it. Not an astonishing amount but uh, she talked about her experience with self publishing. Um, she said for her it cost a lot and she earned very little and and I I think it's great that she shared this. Um, I'm I'm glad that she uh, you know gave the actual numbers and she says that the books were classified as new adult fantasy which is not really a thing in traditional 
publishing and they probably didn't hit the right market in indie either because they weren't sexy enough. Um, so I, I would kind of like, and then she goes on from there and she talks about how much money she spent. Um, she spent $5,000 on the first book in its first six months, uh, which is a lot, a lot to spend on a book when you're a newbie self publisher. And I touched on this earlier this week where I mentioned that, um, if you don't have a platform already, it's hard to get started in self publishing. And, and she did end up selling like the mythical, you know, average of a hundred and only to friends and family. But I think there are a lot of reasons for this. And one is putting a whole lot of that money up front into that first book without having the second one ready. Uh, and then the way that it sounded, let's see, I won't go into her whole, uh, thing, but yeah, it took a long time for the second book to come out. She really invested a lot in trying to get that first book to happen, which is just not how it works for self publishing. Uh, she said when the second book launched, she sold like 15 copies on the first day, ultimately like 129 copies of the first book and 112 of the second before she pulled them from the market. And it's not clear to me why she decided to pull them from the market. Uh, once you have, once you've invested, once you have put them up, it doesn't cost you anything to keep them up. So it's not clear to me why she decided to pull them. Uh, she does say at the end that, you know, her conclusion is, um, that there's no easy way to publish. There's no get rich quick path in this industry. So that's what she wants to warn people of. And, and that's absolutely right. That's a good take home message. She also says, um, there are ways not to make the mistakes that she did, uh, to make self publishing a business and to succeed at it. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I saw her doing. She says, um, $10,000 she spent, uh, two and a half years on these books, selling 241 copies of her books and netting something like $750. The transcript's going to hate these numbers. It ha always hates numbers. Um, but one of the first things I noticed, I mean, there are a number of things that didn't go well, uh, especially if you are doing a series, if you have both books ready, maybe she didn't, but it's really worthwhile to have that second book ready so that the people who do want to read can read right away. Once you have a readership, they'll wait. Um, if they're still getting to know you, they won't wait especially if they're not sure if you'll finish the series and it's a real thing. If you're an unknown quantity, uh, if there's a, you know, the story needs to be resolved with finishing the series or finishing the second or the, you know, last two books, uh, people want to know that it's there before they commit because they've been burned before. Thank you, George R. R. Martin. Uh, the other thing that is a real red flag at the beginning is when she said that it was new adult fantasy, which isn't really a thing in traditional publishing. And I've mentioned this before. Self publishing is great for grabbing niche markets that traditional publishing won't touch. This is so true. It's true for my books. It's true for a lot of fantasy romance. It's true for a lot of science fiction, fantasy and romance crossover. There's not a great place for it on the bookshelf at the bookstores, the brick and mortar stores, because those are two different bookshelves, right? So they don't know which one to put it on if, and as soon as they have to make a decision, they feel like it's going to be bad. They're not happy. If it's young adult. Yeah. Something just hit my face. I don't even know what that was. <laughs> Felt like it was flung, but there's a little bit of a breeze. So maybe that was just liberated by the breeze. Uh, young adult has now become its own category. And when people 
rant, as I've seen various editors and agents do, that young adult doesn't count as a genre because you have all sorts of genres within young adult. Well, it's true, except that there are young adult shelves in the bookstore. And once it's a shelf, then they know where to put it and it has a market in the brick and mortar stores. The online stores often reflect the brick and mortar stores. They have more shelves and can put things in multiple places, but still there's, there's some, um, some correlation between the two. So all of this is a long way of saying that if you want to publish your book that you love, which, you know, bless you, of course you do. And you know, do it, definitely do it, but know that if it's a book, that's not really a thing in traditional publishing, it's going to make it harder for you to sell as a self publisher, especially if you don't already have a readership, right? It's, um, it's just, and, and especially if you're, you know, not already a savvy marketer, which not many of us are, especially when we start, right? So you, you're stacking the odds against yourself why this gal pulled them from the market. I don't know. And I almost want to ask her and I could follow the Twitter thread. If any of you have the leisure, follow the Twitter thread and see if somebody asks her or ask her yourselves. Uh, there, there isn't a good reason to pull it. And she, maybe she had one, but otherwise the money is spent, leave them up and maybe they will gradually gain a readership. Part of the problem with, you know, spending money on advertising is if you advertise something that's not really a thing, how do you advertise it? What I've got and and now it's itchy on my face where that thing hit me, whatever it was, you know, if, how are you going to advertise it? If you don't really know what it is and you're not able to tell the readers what it is, new adult fantasy, um, with. And you know, it's, that's an, a frequent, I don't want to say excuse, but I hear authors say a lot like, oh, well, it didn't do well because it didn't have enough sex in it because I didn't want to, I don't know. There's always a little, and I don't know that she means this at all. She may not, but there's always a little bit of a sense of, you know, I wanted to maintain my standards and not put sex in it and therefore, uh, because I didn't kowtow to the, uh, sex loving masses. It didn't do well. Maybe that's not what she means by that, but there are plenty of books that do not have hot sex on them that do very well. I'm reading one right now. I'm waiting to see if there ends up being a sex scene in it. Uh, I've read a couple recently that, uh, you know, slow burn romances don't have any sex in the first book at all. You know, maybe there's a promise of it later. We, we kind of know by authors, that's part of having the reputation, having the readership, but no, you don't have to have it in there. Um, yeah, I I'm sorry that this went badly for her, but she also spent two and a half years on this. Uh, that's a long time to spend getting two books out in self publishing. It's just, it's way too long. And I know that not everybody has the luxury of, uh, time to spend on it and not everybody writes fast, but it's just something to keep in mind. There were a lot of things stacked against her on this and you know, it'd be great if somebody would step in and help her out and say, you know, let's put those books back up and let's see if we can get them to go somewhere. The other thing is, is if you are a new author and you have not yet published anything. It's hard to know if your books are good. Um, or, you know, good. You guys know that you all know that I don't like the use of the word good, but you don't know if the books will really grab people if you haven't established a readership yet. And it could be that those books should be trunk books. I don't know. I haven't read them. Not all books are going to do well. That's just life. Uh, there's books of mine that, uh, you know, 
but the second novel I ever wrote, I still love that novel, but if I'm going to put it out there, I'm going to have to rewrite it because I, I know a lot of the things that are wrong with it now. And those are just things you learn with time. So I just wanted to, uh, to talk about that. It's, it's an unfortunate piece of self publishing that many, many authors get into it because they decide to self publish the book that they couldn't sell the trad. And certainly I've done that, but I know at this point why it didn't sell the trad. Uh, you, you have to know, is it, did it come close? Like, was it really because they didn't know what shelf to put it on or was it because everyone was like, you know, this book isn't done cooking yet. Uh, it's hard to listen to that feedback. I saw a meme the other day of somebody like showing like an author getting their uh, feet criticism and like cutting up their heart on a plate. And I would, <laughs> it's like, well, that's probably, probably you should um, have a little bit more objectivity than that. It's not your heart. They're cutting up. They're talking about something you produced, but yeah, you got, you got to listen to what kind of feedback are you getting on the book? Why, why does traditional publishing not want it? And it's not always because they're messed up in the head, which is tends to be the Kool-Aid on that note. Um, I am going to go get to work and write the book that I just put up the pre-order for, uh, watch for the cover reveal taking shape today. I think it's going to be kind of cool and pre-order link in the show notes. And, uh, I will talk to you all tomorrow. You all take care. Bye-bye.